It was Taru who asked Ryu for the interview he refers to in his diary. On that evening, as it happened, just before Taru arrived, the doctor had gazed for some moments at his mother, who was sitting very still in a corner of the dining room. Once her ha household tasks were over, she spent most of her time in that chair. Her hands folded in her lap, she sat there waiting. Ryu wasn't even sure it was for him she waited. However, something always changed in his mother's face when he came in. The silent resignation that a laborious life had given it seemed to light up with a sudden glow. Then she returned to her tranquility. That evening, she was gazing out of the window at the now empty street. The street lighting had been reduced by two thirds and only at long intervals, a lamp cast flickering gleams through the thick darkness of the town. Will they keep to the reduced lighting as long as the plague lasts? Madame Ryu asked. I expect so. Let's hope it doesn't last till winter. It would be terribly depressing. Yes, Ryu said. He saw his mother's gaze settle on his forehead. He knew that the worry and overwork of the last few days had scored their traces there. Didn't things go well today? His mother asked. Oh, much as usual. As usual. That was to say the new consignment of serum sent from Paris seemed less effective than the first, and the death rate was rising. It was impossible to administer prophylactic inoculations elsewhere than in families already attacked. If its use was to be generalized, very large quantities of the vaccine would have been needed. Most of the bubbles refused to burst. It was as if they underwent a seasonal hardening and the victims suffered horribly. During the last 24 hours, there had been two cases of a new form of the epidemic. The plague was becoming mnemonic. On this very day, in the course of a meeting, the much harassed doctors had pressed the prefect, the unfortunate man seemed quite as at his wit's end, to issue new re regulations to prevent contagion being carried from mouth to mouth, as happens in mnemonic plague. The prefect had done as they wished, but as usual, they were groping, more or less, in the dark. Looking at his mother, he felt an uprush of a half-forgotten emotion, the love of his boyhood, at the sight of her soft brown gaze intent on him. Don't you ever feel alarmed, mother? Oh, at my age, there isn't much left to fear. The days are very long, and just now I'm hardly ever at home. I don't mind waiting, if I know you're going to come back, and when you aren't here, I think of what you're doing. Have you any news? Yes, if I'm to believe the last telegram, everything's going as well as could be expected. But I know she says that to prevent my worrying. The doorbell rang. The doctor gave his mother a smile and went to open the door. In the dim light on the landing, Taru looked like a big gray bear. Ryu gave his visitor a seat facing his desk, while he himself remained standing behind his, the desk chair. Between them was the only light in the room, a desk lamp. Taru came straight to the point. I know, he said, that I can talk to you, you quite frankly. Ryu nodded. In a fortnight or a month at most, Taru continued, you'll serve no purpose here. Things will have got out of hand. I agree. The sanitary department is inefficient, understaffed, for one thing, and you're worked off your feet. Ryu admitted this was so. Well, Taru said, I've heard that the authorities are thinking of a sort of conscription with, of the population, and all men in good health will be required to help in fighting the plague. Your information was correct, but the authorities are in none too good odor as it is, and the prefect can't make up his mind. If he daren't risk compulsion, why not call for voluntary help? It's been done. The response was poor. It was done through official channels and half-heartedly. What they're short on is imagination. Official dumb can never cope with something really catastrophic, and the remedial measures they think up are hardly adequate for a common cold. If we let them carry on like this, they'll soon be dead, and so shall we. That's more likely, Ryu said. 
I should tell you, however, that they're thinking of using the prisoners in the jails for what we call the heavy work. I'd rather free men were employed. So would I. But might I ask why you feel like that? I loathe men's being condemned to death. Ryu looked Teru in the eyes. So what? he asked. It's this I have to say. I've drawn up a plan for voluntary groups of helpers. Get me empowered to try out my plan, and then let's sidetrack officialdom. In any case, the authorities have their hands more than fully already. More than full already. I have friends in many walks of life. They'll form a nucleus to start from. And of course, I'll take part in it myself. I need hardly tell you, Ryu replied, that I accept your suggestion most gladly. One can't have too many helpers, especially in a job like mine under present conditions. I undertake to get your plan approved by the authorities. Anyhow, they've had no choice, but, Ryu pondered, but I take it you know that work of this kind may prove fatal to the worker, and I feel I should ask you this. Have you weighed the dangers? Taru's gray eyes met the doctor's gaze serenely. What did you think of Panalu's sermon, doctor? The question was asked in a quite ordinary tone, and Ryu answered in the same tone. I've seen too much of hospitals to relish any idea of collective punishment. But as you know, Christians sometimes say that sort of thing without really thinking it. They're better than they seem. However, you think like Panalu that the plague has its good side. It opens men's eyes and forces them to take thought. The doctor tossed his head impatiently. So does every ill that flesh is heir to. What's true of all evils in, this, in the world is true of plague as well. It helps men to rise above themselves. All the same, when you see the misery it brings, you need to be a madman or a coward or stone blind to give in tamely to the plague. Ryu had hardly raised his voice at all, but Taru made a slight gesture as if to calm him. He was smiling. Yes, Ryu shrugged his shoulders. But you haven't answered my question yet. Have you weighed the consequences? Taru squared his shoulders against the back of the chair, then moved his head forward into the light. Do you believe in God, doctor? Again, the question was put in an ordinary tone, but this time Ryu took longer to find his answer. No, but what does that really mean? I'm fumbling in the dark, struggling to make something out but I've long ceased finding that original. Isn't that it, the gulf between Panalu and you? I doubt it. Panalu is a man of learning, a scholar. He hasn't come in contact with death. That's why he can speak with such assurance of the truth, with a capital T. But every country priest who visits his parishioners and has heard a man gasping for breath on his deathbed thinks as I do. He tried to relieve human suffering before trying to point out its excellence. Ryu stood up. His face was now in shadow. Let's drop the subject, he said, as you won't answer. Taru remained seated in his, in his chair. He was smiling again. Suppose I answer with a question. The doctor now smiled, too. You like being mysterious, don't you? Yes, fire away. My question's this, said Taru. Why do you yourself show such devotion, considering you don't believe in God? I suspect your answer may help me to mine. His face still in shadow, Ryu said that he'd already answered, that if he believed in an all-powerful God, he would cease curing the sick and leave that to him. But no one in the world believed in a God of that sort. No, not even Panalu, who believed that he believed in such a God. And this was proved by the fact that no one ever threw himself on providence completely. Anyhow, in this respect, Ryu believed himself to be on the right road in fighting against creation as he found it. Ah, Taru remarked, so that's the idea you have of your profession. More or less, the doctor came back into the light. Taru made a faint whistling noise with his lips, and the doctor gazed at him. 
Yes, you're thinking it calls for pride to feel that way. But I assure you, I have no more than the pride that's needed to keep me going. I have no idea what's awaiting me, or what will happen when all this ends. For the moment, I know this. There are sick people, and they need curing. Later on, perhaps, they'll think things over, and so shall I. But what's wanted now is to make them well. I defend them as best as I can. That all, that's all. Against whom? Ryu turned to the window. A shadow line on the horizon told of the presence of the sea. He was conscious only of his exhaustion, and at the same time was struggling against a sudden, irrational impulse to unburden himself a little more to his companion. An eccentric, perhaps, but who, he guessed, was one of his own kind. I have a notion, Taru. I assure you I haven't a notion. When I entered this profession, I did it abstractedly, so to speak, because I had a desire for it, because it meant a career like another, one that young men often aspire to. Perhaps, too, because it was particularly difficult for a workman's son, like myself. And then I had to see people die. Do you know that there are some who refuse to die? Have you, have you ever heard a woman scream, Never! with her last last gasp well I have and then I saw that I could never get hardened to it I was young then and I was outraged by the whole scheme of things or so I thought subsequently I grew more modest only I've never managed to get used to seeing people die that's all I know yet after all Ryu fell silent and sat down he felt his mouth dry after all Taru prompted softly after all, the doctor repeated, then hesitated again, fixing his eyes on Taru. It's something that a man of your sort can understand most likely, but since the order of the world is shaped by death, mightn't it be better for God if we refuse to believe in him and struggle with all our might against death without raising our eyes toward the heaven where he sits in silence? Taru nodded. Yes, but your victories will never be lasting. That's all. Ryu's face darkened. Yes, I know that, but it's no reason for giving up the struggle. No reason, I agree. Only I now can picture what this plague must mean for you. Yes, a never-ending defeat. Taru stared at the doctor for a moment, then turned and tramped heavily toward the door. Ryu followed him and was almost at his side when Taru, who was staring at the floor, suddenly said, who taught you all this, doctor? The reply came promptly. Suffering.